Uh, Sharon, as a leader and innovator in nursing in general and psychiatric nursing specifically, I'd be interested to hear your vision for integrated care as we continue. It's important to, um, for us to understand that all the data that was collected over the past 30 years had some significant findings. It's important to understand that 80% of all psychotropic medications are prescribed by primary care providers, yet primary care providers fail to, do, to demonstrate adequate diagnostic criteria and do not advance the, the level of initial medication when trial is inadequate. This is a finding that um, dates back many years and still they have not been able to implement further changes in this. We need to develop a health care plan that actually is, addresses this and by providing us um, a chance to walk into the primary care practice and say we will help you with your integration, we will help you with your psychotropic medications and we will demonstrate it in a way that is ethical efficacious for your patients and then follow it through with evidence-based practice. The second finding that, that is very critical to developing a model is understanding that um, mentally ill um, die 25 years earlier than their peers and this is primarily due to cardiovascular and metabolic disorders that are treatable. Patients um, with mental illness do not seek as much primary care as they should and they're not they're they're fearful of the judgment and they're fearful of walking into the doctor's office and that is something which i i see every single day when i'm working in the primary care office is when you see somebody who has elevated blood pressure and is is uh, bipolar and you say is it because of white coat syndrome they say i hate coming to the doctor i avoid it like the plague yet they're severely depressed or they're severely manic and they have some significant mental health issues it's important to also address the cardiovascular and the met metabolic disorders of patients with mental illness and there's a lot of data on this about smoking cessation it's about a data about um, the medications, the impact on their bodies, and the lack of monitoring in primary care, as well as um, psychiatric care. And we really do have to be responsible for our patient population. It's not just their uh, mental health that we're responsible for, but as psychiatric nurse practitioners are further um, uh, progressing our, our field, we are responsible for their medical care in increasing numbers. We can do a lot of physical assessment and refer them to the proper people. So it's very treatable if we really wrap it around. Now since this uh, this finding has come out, um, it's been I think it's been 20 years since the finding has come out and the finding has not been significantly changed. The data is still the same. So we really haven't in the past, even with the the past healthcare system, haven't changed the way that we've handled um, some of the uh, our mentally ill. The next finding I wanted to discuss was three out of ten patients with, with a medical disorder also have a mental health disorder. I was surprised that it was this low. I see a lot of patients that have medical disorders that, you know, a lot of them do have more significant mental health disorders. Seven out of ten um, people with mental illness have a medical illness, and I'm not surprised by this at all. This was actually more on key. Major depression is a risk factor for developing a medical condition, and the findings have found that it's, a lot of it is because of pain and inflammation. Immobility, um, obesity, uh, smoking, all impact on the ability for mental, uh, on a patient to manage their medical problems and have uh, good health care. So it's very important to understand that. But there's other findings, and we have to, when we develop a vision, when we develop a model for integrated healthcare that's focused on nursing, focused on psychiatric nursing especially, we need to take into, into account that these statistics can, need to be identified and used to develop that program. And in the, ne in the next slide, we, we talk about the fact that asthma, people with asthma are more likely to be diagnosed with depression. So by, scre by screening for depression on every asthma patient would be something that we would do. Over, primary care home is the perfect place for mental health because 70% of all primary care visits can be also have also have complications of psychosocial issues. And most primary care physicians are not equipped or lack the time to fully address the wide ranges of psychosocial issues that are presented um, by patients. And emergency rooms. Um, my husband's an emergency physician, and his organization has, has described how over 
of all patients that present in emergency departments, and I think that that is actually a low ball number, um, have a psychiatric complaint, um, mental health or a substance abuse disorder. And nearly half of all cigarette consumption, which we know is tied, tied to asthma, um, cancers, and, uh, and other significant illnesses, over half of the patients who, who have um, cigarette consumption also have behavioral health disorders. So we have some significant issues. And if we turn to pediatrics, pediatrics has a bigger impact. We actually could um, under, do a lot of good work with um, child and adolescent psychiatry by actually doing a pediatric integrated medical home or addressing and assessing the pediatric need. Um, by targeting early intervention of developmental disabilities, of childhood somatization disorders, including obesity and headaches, of mood disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder, personality disorders, intensive mental health um, services to do uh, early intervention for family system issues. But the reason why we need to do this is because of the 20% of all children exhibit symptoms of some form of mental illness, yet only 20% of those children actually receive treatment. Over 50% of all lifetime cases of substance abuse actually can be um, tracked back to age 14. Okay, and that's essentially true for the same for mental health disorders. And three-fourths of uh, patients with substance abuse disorders are seen by 24 age 24. So early identification um, can be done in pediatric homes, and we do have a place there. And plus, there's a severe shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists, and this puts more pressure on the pediatricians and the pediatric nurse practitioners to screen, diagnose, and prescribe for children and adolescents, even with, with very little knowledge. And they don't have the ability to do early intervention and psychotherapy or know where to uh, send patients. Um, to get the right help for the families to do the, the a, more of a, a deeper assessment. And that is something which they're now being pressured just to medicate them. And that's not the first line of treatment recommended by the American Academy of uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists. OK, thank you for describing your vision for integrated care. Um, I, we certainly need this type of care. And I think you've made a clear case for why children especially need this type of care. Could you now provide us with a firm look at what integrated health care actually is? Oh, yes. That's good. We have to look at the fact that it really means a systematic coordination of physical and behavioral health care. It, in, in a lot of the earlier definitions, it meant that you really did have to share the common space, the common vision, be integrated fully into the medical practice, and be employed by them. And that's great in the clinic model with, with public health. But when you take it outside of public health and you take it into health care uh, that is more your common health care in your communities, which is um, in, your, in your private medical practices and pediatric practices that take commercial insurance, it really doesn't necessarily have to be on site all the time. It just means that it has to have systematic coordination of physical and behavioral health care. And what that means is that you have to have access to psychiatric or behavioral health consultants, which means that the, you can be co-located with, like in, in my situation, we do have an office within their within their office. We actually have a wellness center, a little booth, a, a little room um, with a door, and uh, you know we have a privacy ability. It's a good enough size that we can actually do a psychiatric interview and do some brief psychotherapy and and pre prescribe interventions and medication and variety of things and, and track and trend them. But it's co-located because some of that information is shared and some of that information is not. We still live in a two-silo world where my reimbursement comes from, from a commercial insurance, and it doesn't come from the same commercial uh, branch that the uh, primary care doctors get. So they can't really hire me and get reimbursed for me. That in the future might change with different models being proposed with reimbursement. Um, but the key thing is that we also need to collaborate on patient care, which means that if a patient has migraines and they also have anxiety, well, is the anxiety causing the migraines? We have to work together in understanding what, what is appropriate to deal with with that patient. And we do this every day. And this is, this is what integration 
um, is about. Integrated mental health is about that, that bringing together and collaborating with the primary care provider. It could be the nurse practitioner on um, patient care. Okay, Unified documentation is nice when possible. And the way that you, in an integrated mental health system, giving them information about how you saw the patient, what medication you've prescribed, your diagnostic uh, criteria that you've, the formulation of the problem and the diagnosis, and the interventions given. It doesn't have to give information that is confidential. It doesn't have to share um, substance abuse either. It has to be about what is critical to, be, uh, to, to the care planning. It, also, collaboration and integrated healthcare is about the education of the uh, consumer regarding their health challenges, their, and what interventions were given, and what medication, and how that needs to get followed through also with the primary care providers. And that's, that's truly the care coordination that's needed. Um, also, if we refer a patient for labs or if we refer a patient for a sleep study um, because of insomnia. Um, this is within our realm. This is our scope of practice. We can do whatever we need to do within our scope of practice, but the care coordination of making sure the patient goes for those services needs to also then get communicated back to the primary care team as well so that they can reinforce it for us. And it's just a, a key to that. Um, process. The patient-centered medical home also defines integrated health care. And they, do, they define it a little bit differently because they talk about the reimbursement models and the benchmarks. And the insurance companies are, incorpor are incorporating meaningful use and, me and measurable outcome parameters in integrated health care. So they are redefining it uh, in terms of data collection and data expectations. And this is going to help us with the incentives, increasing our incentives for evaluation and, medical and management codes. And with that, we are, we're going to be able to handle a lot more, more cost effectively so that we'll be able to afford EMR, we'll be afford, able to afford care management and care, care coordination time and team building uh, not reflected in the dollars and cents that we, we have at this point because that isn't covered. So that's really where we're going with as far as the integration, where it's been defined as far as the parameters of integration, and then it was defined a little bit more with the reimbursement of integration. Now, the data regarding um, patient medical home, there's a decrease. There's, there's a lot of cost savings that we've been seeing in, in, in the data. And a lot, there is a data that just came out um, this past this, this month, January 2014, called the Patient Center Medical Homes Impact on Cost and Quality, and it's an annual update to the evidence um, that, that they've had before. But this reflects the 2012 and 2013 data. And in the, in the past, they've seen that um, the cost savings of 20% to 40% are not uncommonly reported in the design population. There's an increase in patient self-management. There's a reduction in use of unnecessary or avoidable services. There's an improvement in patient health indicators and increase in preventative services. And there's improved quality and improved access, which then increases uh, patient satisfaction. Um, patients become more involved in the patient-centered medical home, and they, they really do want to be involved. They want to be able to handle a lot more um, of their own care and understand what's expected of them. So that's, that's a very important um, way of looking at our cost effectiveness. And therefore, once they demonstrate cost effectiveness, then we're going to be able to uh, ask for what we, what we need as far as a profession for our reimbursement.